Hey everybody, Darren Burrows here. Today I wanna to walk you through a strategy. It's one of my favorites. It's called Flip to Joint Venture. And the reason I like this strategy is because it combines two of my favorite things, flipping properties, making some money on every single transaction, and also the long-term buy and hold, putting tenants in place and having that rental income, having the mortgages paid down, and the property appreciating over time. If we combine these two and we do it properly, we can get paid on every single transaction. We can own a portion of the property moving forward and have long-term rental income. If this sounds too good to be true, it's not, but you gotta do it properly. So I'm gonna walk you through all of the numbers, how I recently did this on a transaction, and I'll break it down for you step by step exactly how it works. I think once you see this strategy, it's almost impossible for you not to wanna be able to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell so you can see all new videos coming out from my channel. And without further ado, let's get into it. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna show you the property that we actually purchased to be able to do this recently. This was a 19 sort of 50s, 60s raised bungalow in Red Deer, Alberta. This property was on the market for four days, so we went in and made an offer after four days of it being on the market. I'll tell you this, if you're going in, it doesn't matter whether the market's doing well or whether the market's flat or moving down. If you're going in and making an offer after four days of a property being on the market, you're not going to get a great deal. The seller feels like they've got a solid property and they're not gonna be in a huge negotiating position. The reason I put an offer in on this property was because I own a couple of other ones like it in my portfolio. And I know just by looking at the picture of this property, the chances of this style of property having a back door or a side door that leads right to the basement are high. And if I know that, then I know that I can put a legal basement apartment in this property. So if you create a system and you work within your system, you can add properties to your system very, very quickly just by looking at a picture. I didn't go to this property. I didn't see a whole lot of other pictures before I made an offer. We just saw this one come up in a neighborhood we really like. We know the numbers in that neighborhood. We made an offer and then we did our due diligence after that. So we tie up the property with an offer. We had a conditional offer on home inspection, financing, and we wanted to talk to the city of Red Deer to make sure we could put a legal basement apartment in this property. So the asking price for this property was $260,000. As I mentioned earlier, if you're going in four days after the property's on the market, you're not gonna get a great deal. What we did is we negotiated down to $254,000. We got a $6,000 reduction on the purchase price. We thought that was pretty decent. After we come to an agreement with the sellers, now we start our due diligence process. Generally, my due diligence works in this order. I would check with the city first to make sure we can put a legal basement apartment in that property. If we can't put a legal basement apartment in this property, we would just walk away from the transaction. Second thing, I always put my financing second, make sure that I check with my mortgage broker to make sure that I can actually finance this property. The third thing, once we've cleared the city and once we've cleared our financing is I do my home inspection. For those of you wondering if you should do home inspection, to me, there's always value in this. Hire really good quality individuals. Don't let the price tag be the only determining factor for choosing a home inspector. My home inspector was great. It cost me about $450 for a home inspection on this property. He checked all the systems. He looked at the exterior, looked at the interior. And one of the things they do on the interior is they test the plumbing system. So he filled up all the sinks with water, filled up the bathtubs to a certain point, and then he unplugs all the drains at the same time, flushes the toilets at the same time, and puts all that water into the system. This tells the home inspector two things, if the plumbing venting is working properly, and secondly, because there's so much water being put into the system, if there's any clogs in the drains, this will generally show up at this time. So after the home inspector puts all that water into the system, he goes down into the basement. In the basement shower and the floor drain in the utility room, the sewer water started backing up into the property. So we immediately know there's a problem. At that point, I hired a secondary inspector. This is someone that has a drain snake that has a camera on it. So we can actually send the camera down the line and figure out exactly what's going on in that pipe. There's an additional cost to this inspection as well. But to me, it was worth every single dollar because when that camera goes down the drain, we realized under the floor in the basement, there's actually a blockage in that pipe, a collapsed pipe. And that is not an easy repair. That's something where the floor is gonna have to be taken up in the basement and that pipe's gonna have to be replaced. So I asked my plumber at that time what the approximate cost of that repair is and he said about $5,000. The hot water tank was old and had scorch marks on it and the dishwasher was also not functioning well. So we asked the sellers for a $6,000 reduction on the purchase price and we got it with not a lot of questions asked. So now we've ended up purchasing this property for $248,000. After removing our conditions and prior to closing, if you're using bank financing, the bank will always come in and do an appraisal on that property. So the appraisal came back at $260,000. 
What that means is we've purchased this property $12,000 under market value. Not because they were asking 260, but because the bank said it was worth 260 and we were able to purchase it for $248,000. Now, because I'm only gonna hold this property short term, I actually didn't go to a standard A lender to get financing on this property. I went to a B lender. With B lenders, you're going to pay a slightly higher interest rate Generally, the down payments are a little bit more and you're going to pay a lender fee. That's a percentage amount you're going to pay to the lender based on the loan amount that you won't get back. So in our case, the lender asked for a 25% down payment and a 1% lender fee, which if the mortgage amount is $186,000, that's $1,860 you have to pay to the lender just to get that financing. So our initial capital contribution on this property was $65,000. That was the down payment and the closing costs. And because this property is in Alberta, there's no land transfer tax. The renovation on this property cost $42,000 to make it a legal basement apartment. Depending on the municipality in which building code you're working under, the regulations to make a legal suite will be different in every single province and every single city. So just check with your city in terms of what's required to make a legal basement apartment. In Red Deer, Alberta, for instance, each unit has to have its own heating system. So there are additional costs to that. I did save a little bit of money by being the general contractor on this transaction, but as you'll see a little bit later on, I did pay myself for my time. So with the $65,000, $1,000 initial capital contribution and the $42,000 renovation. At this point, the total capital required to be into this transaction is $107,000. So, so far we've purchased the property, we've renovated to make a legal suite, and now we're ready to put the tenants in place. Once the tenants are in place, now we take this property and we sell it to another investor as a turnkey investment, but we retain a portion of the ownership of the property. I'll say that again, we buy it, we renovate it, we put tenants in place, we sell it to another investor, but we retain a portion of the ownership on the property. So who sets the sale price at that point? I do. Now, I can really ask for whatever I want, but we have to make sure that the property is going to appraise for the value that we set on this property. We also have to make sure that it makes sense for another investor to come in and it's still gonna be a cash flowing property. So I set the purchase price at $320,000. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. We set the price a little bit higher than probably what this property was worth and I'll explain why I did that in a second. But as long as the property appraises for what you've set that value at, that's all that really matters. So we actually draw up a purchase and sale agreement because now I'm going to exit this transaction on paper. My other investor comes in at this point and they purchase the property from me, they qualify for financing and they put up the down payment capital. Because my partner is qualifying for financing, they're gonna get a new mortgage. Up to this point, this is pretty much a standard flip. I bought the property, I renovated it, I put tenants in place, then I sold it to another investor. The investor comes in, now they put up their own capital and their own mortgage on the property. The difference is, is that I negotiated a percentage ownership of this property moving forward. In this case, it was a 50-50 split on cash flow and appreciation. So the lawyer handles the transaction and now we've actually closed on the property with $320,000 being the new purchase price. I don't actually get $320,000 at this point because the lawyer is actually going to pay out my mortgage and my legal fees before issuing me funds. So the mortgage gets paid out. The old mortgage is now at $184,000. Because we owned the property for three months while we were renovating, we made some principal payments down on the loan. We also had to pay the legal fees and my partner and I split this. So we each paid $1,000 on the legal fees. At this point, I end up with a check for $135,000. So I pay myself back my initial capital, which was $65,000. I also pay myself back for the renovation, which was $42,000. I also had to pay about $3,000 in carrying costs because while we were renovating, we had to pay the mortgage, property tax, utilities, and insurance. So what I'm left with after all of that is a profit of $25,000. So how much of that $25,000 is subject to capital gains? Here's the best part, none of it. The reason there's no capital gains to be paid here is because I'm still a percentage owner of this property. I have not liquidated my interest and therefore I do not have to pay capital gains. But I am not on mortgage and I am not on title of the property, so how do I protect my interest? I protect my interest through a joint venture agreement. We also have a bear trust agreement in the background that tells the tax man that I still own this property, therefore I don't have to pay capital gains on that transaction. The only thing that gives you more satisfaction than not actually having to pay capital gains on a transaction is smashing the light button.
With my $25,000 check that I got on closing after I paid myself back for all of my expenses is I did something a little bit different. I took the $25,000 and I cut my joint venture partner a check for $12,500. I actually gave him half my profits as a cash back on closing. It wasn't necessary for me to do this, but does my joint venture partner like working with me just a little bit more? Is he going to recommend me to other people as a joint venture partner? And have I lowered the amount of capital that he has into the transaction by giving him $12,500 back on closing? The answer to all those questions is yes, and that's why I did it. And this is why we elevated the purchase price slightly in the beginning when I sold it to him so that we'd have the option to do a cash back on closing. So the question should be, why would my joint venture partner qualify for financing, put up the down payment and hold the mortgage in their name and be okay with a 50% ownership in the property. Well, let me show you the operating numbers moving forward and you'll understand why. So here's what this property generates on an ongoing basis. The gross operating income on this property is $25,608. The reason it's a weird number is because we always factor in vacancy. We take the vacancy right off the top and that's included in our first gross operating income. The operating expenses on this property are 8619. Those are all the things that we pay for. And I'll give you a little bit of a tip. When you're renovating, try to separate out as many of the utilities as you possibly can. So we put in two electrical panels and two electrical meters. That way the tenants pay for their own electricities and it's one less thing that we have to pay for as owners. The debt servicing on this property is $12,101. That's what we have to pay the bank every single year to finance this transaction. And our cash flow ends up being 4888 on a yearly basis. So if we look at this in the four ways my great properties can make money, and if you haven't seen that video, I'll link to it here or here or somewhere, somewhere. I'll link it somewhere and or in the description down below. You can watch that video so you'll understand the four ways my best properties make profit. So I've got 4888 in positive cash flow on a yearly basis. Each year, the mortgage is being paid down $5,837. The appreciation on the property is impossible to estimate because we don't know what the market's going to do but I like to stay super conservative when it comes to this one. Even if I'm in Alberta and the market's been relatively flat, I believe that over the next five to 10 years, we are going to see an increase that's probably at least in line with inflation. And inflation hovers around 2%. So even a conservative estimation of 1.5% would give me $4,800 a year when it comes to appreciation. And of course, that forced appreciation because we've done that renovation is the $25,000 that I showed you earlier after all my expenses were paid back. So my total year one return is $40,525. I get half of that and my joint venture partner gets half of that. So just over $20,000 in year one. I'll go back to my question earlier. Why would my partner give up 50% of this transaction? Well, what is he or she responsible for in this transaction? I was the one who went out and found the property. I negotiated the deal. My team is in place. I handled the renovation. I handled the city. I dealt with all the permits. I put the tenants in place. My team is gonna manage the property on an ongoing basis. I'm gonna do all that work. All my partner is going to do is lend money and all he's looking for is a specific return on his investment. And as long as they're able to achieve that, they're happy with that percentage split. I also wanna be very clear about something else. When we go to sell this property in the joint venture agreement, it always says, the person who contributed capital is paid back first and then the profits are split 50-50 after that. So it's in my best interest to make this a profitable transaction because if the property doesn't make any money, then I don't make any money because my partner's always paid back first. If we take our year one profit divided by the amount of capital that my partner has into the transaction, that's $20,000 in year one divided by the $65,000 initial investment. The $65,000 is the down payment and closing costs the rate of return is 30% in that first year. And this is why my partner was willing to give up 50% of the transaction. As long as their expectations are being met in terms of the return, then they're gonna be okay with giving up a percentage ownership of the property. Now, if you go out and start doing this, are you gonna be able to get a 50-50 split on every single transaction? That may not be the case. But how much money do I have invested in the transaction at this point? I have zero dollars invested because all the money that I put into it, I got back. So with zero dollars invested, I'd be okay with a 20%, 30%, 40% share on this property moving forward. I'd rather have 10 properties that I own 30% of than two properties that I own 100% of. This way I diversify my risk and I don't have any capital invested in that transaction. I got to make money on the flip. I have no money in the transaction. I get to use the same capital over and over again. I get the long-term benefits of a buy and hold with rental income. I diversify my risk and I'm not on the mortgage or the title so it doesn't affect my credit. To me, this is one of those win-win strategies that's good for my partner and it's also good for me. And your last question should be, 
How do I do this? That's a question of how you're able to market yourself, your skill set, being able to put yourself out there as an investor. And to be honest, you're gonna have to have a bit of a track record in doing this. So you may wanna flip a property or two and then get your systems really operating. Once you've figured that out, then you can use a strategy like this where you can own a percentage of that property moving forward and still benefit from the flip. I really hope you guys enjoyed this strategy. If you do, you can hit the subscribe button. You can also comment below on any questions you have for me. I know this is a bit of a complicated strategy. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Check out my website, darrenvoros.com. And with that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.